I was going to release a totally scathing review for the i9-14900K, but then I started undervolting it and testing it out in gaming performance, and I was actually surprised that it can be a lot more efficient. If you guys want to see that video, I'll put the link right up here for you, but essentially you can get the power consumption of this CPU under half and still get very decent FPS in games. It's just what Intel have decided to do with this CPU is they've decided to just take the foot off the brake and put the foot on the accelerator. And the problem is they're now guzzling way too much gas when they're doing this. And in today's review, we're gonna take a look at the power limit two state as well as the power limit one. And essentially what this does is it allows Intel to get better results on benchmarks because a lot of the benchmarks don't last for longer than this period of time. And then after that, it drops down. So when people like me are doing VRM tests, we'll get cooler temperatures and lower power consumption figures. So let's get into the mediocre, the ugly, and the bad right after today's video sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Antec and the Performance One Full Tower ATX case, supporting the ability to mount up to 400 millimeter GPUs in length, including all the latest RTX 4000 series cards, and having the ability to mount two 360 millimeter radiators simultaneously. Then there's a digital CPU and GPU temperature readout, as well as smart cable management covering. So even if you're messy with cable management, you can still make a beautiful build. Links in description below to find out more. The results of the uncapped setting with the 4900K on say a board like the Z790 Nova from ASRock, which when this board is uncapped, it goes to 340 watts, which is ridiculous. And this is the out of the box default settings. So if you just uncap the power limits, the CPU wants to go to 340 watts power consumption. And this is with a 420 mil air cooler. And even at these temperatures and wattage settings, my CPU went over 100 degrees. And this is in a 25C ambient environment. So the power consumption here on this CPU is ridiculous for its programming and its state out of the box. And we're seeing with the gaming numbers that we showed you previously, the performance can still be very good. But the problem is there, I think, for Intel is that the performance is then behind AMD and so they're not winning out on any of the charts. So they've decided to just throw the power consumption out the window. Where here's where we've done that previous test, but we're gonna show you guys the numbers out of the box for gaming, where we tested it with the 7950X versus the 4900K versus the 7800X3D. And we're showing you guys these results, tested with an RX 7900 XTX, because I just wanted to test instead of testing an Nvidia card for a CPU comparison, I wanted to test the AMD card and at 1080p low settings, it doesn't really make a difference because you start to get actually CPU bound. This has 7,600 megahertz across the board for all three of these comparisons, just to keep it apples to apples, make sure no one's complaining. And here's where, even if on a motherboard like the Nova, it's got the unlimited power caps, but even if you've got a power limit too, you're gonna see the same poor efficiency for wattage as you're seeing in these benchmarks. I tried this on a couple of different motherboards here and it was the same story. The power limit to is 252 watts. So a lot of the times your CPU is just gonna have this inefficient profile for gaming. And even though the performance is pretty good, you what I, my eyes are drawn to that 7800X3D, which is giving you very similar FPS. And a lot of the times it's beating out the 14900K, but it's doing so with much less power. And this is also shown when we tested this from the wall. We're going to focus on Baldur's Gate 3 because this benchmark in particular is both really heavy on the CPU and GPU, as you can see with the FPS just dipping here. And the 7800X3D does the best in this particular benchmark. Now, I will want to look in other games as well, really loading up the CPU so heavy. The 14900K does a better job than the 7950X, but then the 7800X3D does a better job than the 14900K. Anyhow guys, the last game here is Horizon Zero Dawn. And in particular, this can show you how ridiculous the 14900K can get in terms of its power consumption while you're gaming. Now, keep in mind, this is from the wall. So I do look at these figures that the software reports, but I feel like the Intel CPU is under reporting these figures. And so the wall figures is essentially what you're going to be paying on your power bill. And so ultimately always look 
for wall power consumption figures when you're seeing apples to apples, apples comparisons here. And this is where the Intel can blow out to essentially near 600 watts with a Ryzen 9 7900 XTX versus say the 7800X3D, which can go to low 400s. So the power consumption on this CPU can actually be better, but the problem is when you then drop the power consumption of the CPU, it starts to lose clearly against the AMD counterparts, especially the Ryzen 7 7800X3D. And I think this is where Intel decided to just go with these ridiculous uh, power consumption numbers to try to make themselves look like, especially for gaming, relevant on the charts. And so for me personally, both even subjectively and looking at it objectively, I just think it's one of the worst things to go with such high levels of inefficiency on a CPU that could otherwise be a lot better. And if you guys think, oh, Brian, you're just criticizing this because everyone's criticizing the latest 14th gen for power consumption. Actually, no, I've criticized the 7950X. I was one of the few people to criticize that heavily for its out of the box inefficiencies too. I'll put the link to that video up here. but. What we've got here is the same kind of thing as what AMD with, did with the 7950X, except it's a lot worse. So that CPU, the 7950X ran at 230 watts out of the box. This is going up to 340 watts if you want it to, or 320 watts, or 252 watts on PL2. So depending on these power limits, I'll put them in graphs. Productivity was a fairly straightforward comparison here where if you're going with a productivity focused workstation style CPU, then the 7950X or the 14900K, they actually both make sense here. I would personally look at that program in particular, go on forums, talk to people who use that application that you use and see which is the better CPU for the job. Because for me personally, I'm still on for Adobe Premiere Pro and i9-10850K because I feel that does the best job for what I need it to in terms of many actions per minute. And I've made a separate video on this explaining why too. So always get the best CPU, even though we're showing you benchmarks here across a few different applications and productivity benchmarks, always get the best CPU for the job that you need it to do. And so both these CPUs are more than capable of that and the power consumption is higher on the Intel, especially for the same amount of performance that you're getting if we measure that in terms of Cinebench. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about with power consumption and productivity is I did find some anomalies here with the 14900K and that was from the wall versus what the power consumption was actually reporting. I can look into this a little bit later, but I just don't have the time to figure out exactly why this is. So with the CPU, I feel like now it's really on an outdated node. And so Intel have decided to keep the CPU relevant. They're just gonna push it to the brim to keep up on the charts. And this is just let the power consumption get out of control. And so if you back it off a bit, to compete at similar wattage levels as the AMD counterparts, it's then losing a little bit in performance, but it still can be a good CPU. And as I said earlier, the 4900K can make sense if you're using it for an application where it's just got a proven track record and everyone knows it works really well for that particular application. And so that's where my recommendation is going to differ. I'm not going to put out a blanket statement, just say, don't buy the i9-14900K. But I'm going to say, if you're a gamer, I would easily go for the Ryzen 7 7800X3D over the 14900K. And the 7950X, that can also benefit greatly from undervolting and tuning. But the 7800X3D, what you're seeing here is a CPU that doesn't need really any tuning except for locking in your XMP profiles, which we've used 7600 megahertz DDR5 across all these three platforms here just to keep the um, comparison apples to apples and have no one complain. But what we're seeing here is the power consumption on 7800X3D is really a lot better than the other two counterparts and the FPS is still even better too. So I'm looking at here an absolute winner of a gaming CPU for the 7800X3D. Now, even with the 7800X3D, we'll quickly interlude even though it's an i9-14900K review, the 7800X3D will do productivity fine. It's not like you cannot edit videos on this or you cannot do your workload, especially if you've got GPU acceleration in that work application. They've recently updated the Premiere Pro suite 
to utilize the GPUs like AMD and Nvidia GPUs a lot better. So you don't even need to have quick sync enabled anymore to get a lot of the benefits out of editing videos in Adobe Premiere Pro, which I made a previous video over a year ago explaining why quick sync was really good. But that benefit is now being negated because of progress with software. So unfortunately for the i9-14900K here today, blanket recommendation is going to be a miss. I personally wouldn't be buying this CPU. And even then you've got the i9-13900K performing very similar and you can even save money on that CPU at this point in time as of making this video versus the 14900K. And then if you wanna game on Intel and you want that sort of latest and greatest, 12700K is going to give you a lot more bang for your buck than the 13 and also the 14900K ever will. So yeah, 14900K in a bad position, but Intel put themselves here with their lack of innovation, using the same node, using the exact same architecture and just really pushing the power limits even further, especially on these unlocked boards and then giving it a new name, thinking the customer is going to get fooled. And I got news for you Intel, the customer isn't getting fooled the tougher the economic conditions get. They're making much smarter and wiser purchasing decisions. So you're either going to have to innovate and bring new products to the market that people really want to purchase or the sales of 14th gen are going to do pretty poorly. And that's what I feel like is going to happen. 14th gen is going to be a horribly selling CPU lineup where only the people who need it, as we talked about before, for those specific things that they're doing will be buying it as opposed to, I feel like a lot of people going to be going over to especially AMD for gaming for the 7800X 3D, but even then the 7950X is going to offer better efficiency and a lot of workloads. So very tough spot Intel's put themselves in, but we'll come back to another CPU review from Intel, hopefully when 15th gen is launched and we've got much better things to say. New node, new architecture, looking forward to it. I think the potential's there, but this one, it just isn't there, unfortunately. So there's also the Intel APO, if you guys want, we can check that out more in depth, but that one reeks of anti-consumer to me, not being released on 13th gen, which, and 12th gen, I can understand it's slightly different architecture, but 13th gen is identical. So it should be released on 13th gen. I don't see why it couldn't. Anyhow, guys, do let us know your thoughts and opinions down below. Love reading those comments as always, just like this question of the day here. And this comes from Concentrador and they ask, and now how is the Intel Arc A770 doing? And I will not know until I get back to Japan and test it over there because I will revisit Arc. But the last time I revisited it, I didn't have great things to say about it, but hopefully they've improved their driver set a lot to the point where it's a lot more stable and a lot more games even boot up properly and the performance is a lot better. But we'll only find out when we run it through a lot of different tests here. So do look forward to bringing you that update. It will be in a few months though, not any time in the immediate future. Hope that answers that question. I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. If you stayed this far and you're enjoying that tech yes content, then you know what to do. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.